All right, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Dr. J.D. Armstrong. I'm the Maui Technology Education and Outreach Specialist. Uh, one of the things I get to do is put together these talks and, and uh, drag uh, people like Tom in, kicking and screaming to give these talks. <laughs> Actually, he was really easy to get. He's just like, yeah, great. I know what to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a a after you guys throw the rotten tomatoes, then, you know, then they, they don't want to come back. Um, so Tom, I grew up in a, uh, on a small uh, cattle farm in Texas. He got his, uh, his undergraduate degree at Notre Dame and then his PhD at the University of Arizona where he was working on the distribution of magnetic uh, features in the sun and uh, in particular uh, over the, s the solar cycle, he did a lot of polarimetry work and, and measuring, that, uh, measuring the magnetic fields. And so now he uh, came out to Maui to, uh, to work on an, uh, one of the new instruments, one of the first light instruments for the Daniel Kanoe Solar Telescope. Uh, shortly after moving here, uh, he got married to the love of his life, as he puts it, and so he's on permanent honeymoon in, on Maui. Uh, he's, and so he, here is our... Uh, our professional paddler with a uh, astronomy problem. So <laughs> welcome to Tom Shad. I'm starting to mess this up. So fine, can you can you hear me fine? Okay, I'll try not to vary just too much. I sometimes get excited. <laughs> anyway, um, I have to thank JD, even though he just ran away, for roping me, kip, kicking and screaming to come give this talk. Um, I wasn't kicking and I wasn't screaming. <laughs> I actually enjoy these talks quite a bit because what it gives us an opportunity to do is really share the exciting things that are going on in, in solar astronomy and here at the IFA and, and the great engineering feats that we're doing with these, these new instruments that we're developing for the Daniel K and the new A Solar Telescope. So it's a great opportunity for that. Unfortunately, I'm not taking it. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm making it simple. I, I don't, I don't want to talk about my research right now. I, I want to kind of take a step back. Um, and the reason I really want to take this step back is, is that outside. It's, uh, oftentimes, we get locked into our, into our offices, into our da daily routines and everything. And, and so often, it, it just takes that moment at the end of the day when you walk out, especially here, you walk out and you just see that sunset and you realize just how incredible our lives are and how innately connected we are to our sun. Um, so whenever I was thinking about that talk, that's kind of the point that I wanted to get across. And so to do that, I have to move beyond what I, 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 the way I usually think about a talk and move beyond what I was trained to do. Thinking about things in a broad context is very difficult for a doctor. Um, I mean, in, in, you know, when you're doing a PhD, people always tell you that, uh, you know, you're learning more and more about less and less until you know absolutely everything about nothing. So I'm, I'm an expert on a very little, little bitty thing, but I can't talk broadly. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. And in the spirit of starting things with, uh, you know, that broad context, I'm going to start with a poem. Uh, so this poem I chose, this is Robert Louis Stevenson, and it's known as The Summer Sun. And it goes... Great is the sun, and wide he goes, through empty heaven with repose. And in the blue and glowing days, more thick than rain he showers his rays. Though closer still, the blinds we pull, to keep the shady parlor cool. Yet he will find a chink or two, to slip his golden fingers through. The dusty attic spider clad, he, through the keyhole, maketh glad. And through the broken edge of tiles, into the laddered hayloft smiles. Meantime, his golden face around, he bears to all the gold garden ground, and sheds a warm and glittering look among the ivies in most nook. Above the hills, along the blue, round the bright air with pudding true, to please the child, to paint the rose, the gardener of the world, he goes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Everybody clap. <laughs> <laughs> He's great. So 
in that spirit, I want to show you how much I love looking at the sun and, and studying the sun. So I want this experience to be back and forth. So instead of focusing on research, I'm kind of going to focus a little bit on history and, and our relation to the sun. And at any point in this talk, if you have a question, a comment, an anecdote you want to give, some kind of relationship to the sun or just to the talk in general, please feel free to do that. And if my talk runs past, you know, on the 157th slide, um, I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> So maybe, uh, J.D., if we could bring down the lights right here. Um, so my first connection with the sun was, was in Texas on a farm. And in Texas, there was no mountains. We had hay bales. And instead of the beautiful seasons that my, my wife often talks about, we had these kind of things. <laughs> Four seasons, January, summer, summer, and Christmas. Anyhow, so I got kind of tired of working construction for many of the summers and, and, and getting hot in the summer. And I, me being, you know, the golden tan that I am, I didn't burn at all in the summer. So I, I don't know. I got these pictures from a, of a school, University of Notre Dame, that I loved when I was a kid. And I always saw these, like, four beautiful seasons, you know, of how, you know, life progresses up in beautiful Ivy, Ivy League-like country. You know, a luscious winter and a beautiful spring all joy and everything. And this is the picture that, that my wife, who's from Pennsylvania, tells me about all the time. Anyhow, I don't remember any of that. I remember this. <laughs> Someone didn't tell me that most of the beautiful time of the year in Indiana, I was going to be in Texas. Instead, I was going to be up there when there was blizzard, snow covers, and this is Google's image for seasonal affective disorder. <laughs> so after four years of that, I decided yeah, I needed to go dry out in the, um, in the desert for a while, so I went down to Tucson, dried myself out a little bit. And it's just, or it may be worse. Uh, anyway, then I, I got the opportunity to come to, to Hawaii, and, and I learned what the four seasons meant out here. <laughs> and I was flipped. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can deal with this, I thought. Um, However, you know, you, you start to see the diversity of what seasons look like across the globe and, and how different people connect to how these seasons um, are developed. And it's good to take a step back and just kind of remind us how those seasons come about. Um, so let's go to Astro 101 and think about the seasons. Um, the Earth's seasons are a result of the Earth's obliquity, which is just a term for the axial tilt and it's travel around the sun. So what we have here is, is the sun in the center here, and the Earth along its orbit going around and around. Now, in Astronomy 101, whenever I taught it in grad school, I would always try to trick up my students in, in, the, in the first test, and I said, well, at what time of the year is the, sun closest to the, or is the Earth closest to the sun? And oftentimes they would get it wrong, even though I taught them time after time. But it's actually not the case that the Earth is closest to the sun during the summer, but rather in the winter, our northern winter, the sun is closer to the sun. So in this orbit of the Earth, you can see many different features. One, you can see that the, the orbit is not a circular circle. Even though it's exaggerated in this, in this diagram, the orbit of our Earth as we travel around the sun is slightly eccentric. So when we're at the closest point of our sun, called perihelion, we're 147 million kilometers away from the sun. However, when we're on the other side of the orbit at aphelion, we're at 152 million kilometers away. It's a very, very small difference, right? It's a very, very tiny difference. But it does have a profound effect on how we interact with the, or, um, with the sun throughout our seasons. The other things you can, you, you can point out here is the tilt the obliquity. So the obliquity here is as the Earth is going around in its orbit on a flat plane, we'll say, um, it is. The axial position of its rotation, so the point at which um, the Earth is rotating around and around on its, on its body, is not aligned with that plane. So there's a tilt, right? That tilt is the obliquity, or axial tilt, and it's about 23 degrees. So in this 
in this diagram, what you can see is that this tilt as we go around does not change its orientation. It's always oriented in this way in the diagram. Please, first question. Beautiful question. Yeah. So the question from our young scholar here is a question of how did the Earth become stable in its axial tilt? Why is it 23 degrees? And is this a consequence of conservation of angular momentum? And in fact, y yes, it is. In the, in the process of planet formation, when the solar system is collapsing from its cloud, there's a certain amount of angular momentum that pushes these bodies into their orbits. And the residual of that is what brings about this tilt. However, do you know, is the tilt constant? Do you know? Great, yeah. And in fact, the Earth is not balanced. It itself, like a top on a table, can process. So its tilt might be 23.2 degrees right now, but in 10,000 years' time, it might be 21, it might be 25. So that tilt changes throughout or the eons of, of, our, of our lives. Um, great question, keep them coming. So you have a, a couple more things here. First, uh, you see the axial tilt that's going around. So what does that do? It changes the illumination of the sun on the Earth's body. So in this case, you can see that this portion of the Earth is more illuminated than the other side. Whereas if you go to the other end of the orbit, you can see one hemisphere of the Earth is more illuminated than the other. It's flipped. This is what drives the seasons. But there's considerably more even in, than that in this, in this diagram. You can also see that there's a point where there's an equinox. This is the, the normal vernal and uh, uh, autumnal equinoxes where the, the light and day is balanced throughout the day in the hemispheres. Um, however, that's at this point in the orbit, but that does not coincide, coincide with this long axis of the orbit. And that creates some really interesting effects when you uh, look at the sun over the year. But first, let's uh, just take a quick look again at what causes the seasons. The seasons are caused by this axial tilt and the illumination of the sun on the Earth. So when the tilt is directed away, in this case, in the southern hemisphere here, the sun is up for more hours of the day. You get more heat generated, and that's what creates summer. The summer is responding to that extra heat influence from the sun. Uh, complementary to that, of course, the, the northern hemisphere is lacking in sun, and it's cooling off in that period. But so back to this idea of, of the interesting effects these different pieces of the orbit um, come up with. So. I don't know, maybe, maybe I should just ask this question. People, already, people probably know this question, but if, um, say, say you went out every single day at 11 o'clock in the morning on Maui, and you went out and you found where the sun was and you drew a picture and you put where the sun was. And then you did that throughout the whole year and you looked at it, what would you expect? So would that line be aligned with its travel, or would it be north-south, or what would it be? Okay, it's a thought. Um, yeah, so people obviously know where I'm headed. When you do this exercise in, say, Tucson, you get not this straight line, but something that deviates from the straight line a little bit. This is called the analemma. This is a picture of the sun taken at 8.30 in the morning adjusted for daylight savings time in Ajo, Arizona by an amateur astronomer. astronomer. And what he did on this was actually superimposed uh, a multiple exposures on one piece of film of the sun onto a, onto a background image of the same, the same area. So all of these pictures of the sun throughout the year are taken on the same piece of film at 8.30 in the morning. Difficult. <laughs> no. <laughs> People have done this, but... 
So it's a figure eight, and, and it's all over the world. University of Notre Dame on a, not a snowy day. Uh, you get a nice figure eight. This is the Temple of Apollo in Greece. Uh, again, a, a figure eight. And if you get really fancy and you, and you try to match up this thing with a solar eclipse like they did in Turkey back in 2006, this is a tutu lemma. Tutu is from the, from the, the Turkish word for eclipse, I believe. And it's basically an, a, a lemma with a solar eclipse at the same time. So this is the darkened area of the beach, or of the area in Turkey. You have the solar figure eight going around, and then you have an area where the moon is occulting the sun, and you get the, the solar eclipse. <laughs> Beautiful planning. <laughs> That's a great question because that's my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so here's that figure eight, and, and it gives you a few dates on what it actually what it's actually going on here. This is an analemma as viewed if you were at noon GMT time from the Royal or Royal Observatory. Oh, the image is cutting it off, not Royal Observatory, uh, Green, uh, the Greenwich, England. And what you see is the variation of where the sun tracks throughout the year. Um, and what you can see is the dates starting early January, tracking around through middle of summer, and then coming back down, right? So this is the trajectory it comes. And again, there's a, all of those orbital motions that we described in that first diagram are encoded in here, right? So one thing you can see is that um, this distance between where the sun is on the bottom of this plot to the top of this plot is 23.2 times 2 degrees. So that's the Earth's obliquity moving the sun in the sky up and down. So the actual tilt is what's, is what's creating that. And this, is, this motion in this direction is a consequence of the Earth's seasons. Um, so, but, but you can also see that there's a nonlinear effect because of, of how these motions track throughout the year. For example, the, the time it takes the sun to go from this point on October 1st to September 1st is much, this is a much further distance in, in the image than, say, December to November, right? Um, so, but then there's a couple other things. The southern solstice and the northern solstice, remember this is the time when the, uh, you're at the longest time, longest uh, days of the year, or longest nights of the year. You're at the edge where the sun has reached its pinnacle or its, or its uh, highest point in the sky in your year. However, these points when these happen are here and here. It's not symmetric along this line, right? And that's exactly because of this phase shift between where the aphelion and perihelion of the, of the orbit is and where the solstice are. Remember, the solstice are coupled with the obliquity, the axial tilt, whereas this deviation in this, this direction, which we haven't discussed much, is actually due to the eccentricity. Um, so let's look at that again. The three primary dr orbital drivers of what makes this shape are the obliquity, the eccentricity, and this phase difference. Remember, the phase difference is, is essentially this angle between the line of these solstices and the line of the ap apses how you say that, but basically this phase shift. If this, this point was here, then you wouldn't get this anti-symmetric, or this, or not anti-symmetric, but the asymmetric view of that pattern. Um, so if you decouple that motion, as people have done, where you look at what's called the, equ the equation of time for a, for a solar system body, and you look at the different parameters of how that plots on a, on a plot, um, basically, um, what you see is, is in these figures, but I think before I come here, I need to uh, explain one, one other thing. Um, 
in this plot, what we're showing is the is the the position of the sun throughout the year, of course. And we have altitude, which is the location of the sun, um, f according to the angle from the horizon upwards. But in this angle, we have azimuth, which right here I'm saying is facing terrestrial south. This is at, in London. However, what this azimuth is, is a time difference. It corresponds to a time difference of when you expect to see the sun and when you, don't, when you do see the sun. If, if you were in a circular orbit and you're going around and around and around and everything's symmetrical and everything's uniform, you would expect to see the sun at the same point of time every single day, right? That would be the line, exactly what he was saying, right? But our orbit is very slightly eccentric. And <laughs> what happens when you have an eccentricity, if you go back to Johannes Kepler's laws of the solar system, is you have a slight difference in the rate at which the Earth goes around in its orbit. So the, the second law of, of Kepler was that you a body will stri um, cover equal angles um, as projected from the sun in equal amount of time, equal, equal area, sorry. Um, so when you get near perihelion, the body actually accelerates in order to cover more area in this area. So whenever the Earth is coming around perihelion, the Earth is moving faster in its orbit, and when it's at aphelion, it's l moving slower. So what that ends up happening is w whenever your, your body is, er, is, your Earth is rotating, you expect to see the sun at a certain time, but that sun is going to be not only um, in a position according to where you are in your rotation, but also where you are in your orbit. And if you're going faster th than what you would expect otherwise, then the sun would be lagging. It would be a little bit behind. It would be a little slower. It would plot uh, here. Basically, um, and if you were in perihelion, you would expect it to be faster, and that's this side. So it's that eccentricity that's c that's controlling this deviation in this direction. Um, so these are those decouple motions. So this is basically the time difference of when you would expect to see the sun if everything was uniform, everything was the mean solar time. <coughs> And when you actually do as a phase time of the year. Uh, this plot is showing it only if it's eccentricity. This plot is the effect of the obliquity. When you couple these together, you get this kind of plot. You see throughout the year, you get it, the sun's lagging a little bit, then it's a little faster, then it's a little slower, and then it's faster. And when you put that on this type of plot, as this plot shows, or as this dot is showing through time, you get the figure eight. Um, so a consequence of that solar, uh, slower, faster um, expectation of where the sun is, is sunrise, sunset times. So oftentimes you think about the sun being longer or shorter depending on when you are in the year, when you're in the season. But uh, at least for me, whenever I'm trying to paddle or trying to do something else, I often don't think about when the sunrise is, is going to happen. Sometimes I'll Google it and I'll figure out when it is. Sorry, astronomers don't have a sundial or something on their watch. Uh, but as a consequence of this faster and slower, you can see the effect on the sunrise times. For example, um, in this area of the year, which you can't see it on this plot right now, this is October and this is February, so this is northern winter, you can see that in this part of the time, the sun is lagging behind, a, or, or this, or, sorry, the sun is going faster in this plot on this time, and the sunrise comes early. It's at 620 in the morning. On this other side, the sunrise is coming a little later, because the orbit is going a little slower and the sun rises later. That same thing happens up in the summertime, right? Different parts of the summer, you get a little different time in the sun rises. But notice that they're not that big, uh, not, not that different. So this is 15 minutes compared to 40 minutes. And that, again, is that orbital motion. So now, <laughs> there's many probably have seen this next picture or this next simulation, but I'm going to blow your mind and I'm going to ask somebody to explain this. This is what it looks like on Mars. <laughs> it's not a figure eight, right? So this is what the enamel would look like from Mars, um, according to an illustrator at NASA who is taking this from the Mars Pathfinder mission uh, at the Sagan Memorial Station of, of where it was um, 
deployed on the surface of Mars. It's not a figure eight, it's a, it's a teardrop. Um, and we know actually now that this is the, the case for sure, even though we knew it before, we just didn't have the measurements, because NASA Opportunity has start, started to take all sky cams and plot the, the location of the sun in that all sky as a function of time. So what you see here in this background is NASA Opportunity's rover, which is taking a picture at 11.02 mean solar Mars time. Um, don't ask me what that is. <laughs> but what you can see is an all sky wrap around panoramic video so, uh, image so you can see the surface or the horizon of Mars wrap all the way around. This is the sun high in the sky near noon. And this is the plot of where the sun tracks throughout the year. So if you saw a video of this, this is what it looked like. And in fact, they also have a sundial that is used for an image calibration routine on NASA Opportunity that you can plot the position of the shadow as a function of time, and you get this same teardrop. Um, so why is this? Well, someone already said it. Well, do you have, what do you think? You are on the right direction, but flip it. You are you are right. It's it, it has something to do with the eccentricity, but it, it happens that Mars has a higher eccentricity, right? So on the left again, we have Earth. The obliquity is twenty three point four degrees on average right now. The obliquity of Mars is very similar; it's twenty five degrees. The eccentricity of Earth is pretty small, as we showed. It's only a couple couple million kilometers difference throughout the year. The eccentricity of Mars is nine times higher. So between aphelion and perihelion, there's a 43 million kilometer difference. So this is very eccentric as this orbit is going around. And as we showed in the plots earlier, the eccentricity is, is driving this, this width of the analemma. And um, this, this, that term starts to dominate. And what happens is that these spread out, these wings, and this portion of the figure eight disappears. So the figure eight becomes a teardrop. Now you can go do this for all the uh, all the solar system bodies if you wanted to. Um, some of them get a little confusing, like Mercury, because it's in a three two resonance um, in its orbit. But if you look at the the solar system, Venus has uh, an elliptical pattern. The figure eight is on a lot of the bodies, especially the outer solar system bodies, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Um, Mars is the only teardrop, even though Saturn. I say it's a figure eight, but it's a tiny, tiny figure eight. If you were ever to have a chance to land on Saturn and measure it, which is not gonna happen, um, <laughs> it, it would be very, very hard to figure where that little bitty loop was because the eccentricity still dominates. Um, and then Jupiter still has this ellipse and Mars is the one that has the true teardrop. So I, I, I started this talk about the sun and our effects of the lives and the seasons and I've, we've talked a lot about orbital motions and analemmas and uh, you're either bored or you're excited. I don't know, I'm kind of excited, I'm happy about it. Um, but I, I feared that maybe some people weren't gonna be so excited and maybe, okay, we get it, let's move on. So this is me saying, okay, I'm gonna move on. But I'm still excited about this history and orbital motion in some ways and I, and I wanna now think about this as prehistoric folks did and think about the impact that this orbital motion has had on cultures across the across the many uh, centuries. This is a picture, uh, a se sequence of pictures from uh, a historical site in Northern Ireland, just, well actually it's in Ireland, it's just north of Dublin, called Newgrange. It's in County Hoth, no Hoth, Meath, County Meath. And what it is, is a large burial ground that has its origins of about 3200 BC. And like many features around the globe that we've looked at archeologically, we've learned that these things are aligned with the orbits of the world, um, of the earth around, uh, around our sun. So Newgrange is here, a big burial mound with an entrance. That entrance here has some, some rocks in front that actually have um, kind of a Trinity symbol that Think uh, the scholars think uh, has something to do with an, in, an infinite light life, uh, 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 an experience of, of life moving forward and, and progressing. Um, you have an opening here that goes down a shaft, and that shaft is shown here. 
and it's 63 feet in to where the burial grounds are, and it's uh, directly aligned. Um, <coughs> it has yeah, 63 feet down into the middle of this of this hill, and there's multiple of these in in Ireland. This is the one that's the the best preserved. But what happens on the, the winter solstice in December is right at the day of the winter solstice, you have a beam of light from the sun at sunrise that enters in this passage, goes all the way down, straight in, and illuminates the burial ground. And what, what better symbolism of rebirth can, can one have than, than this moment of, of light passing into a, a, into a burial ground in the midst of winter as the one symbol that we have that spring is coming. It's not Game of Thrones. Spring is coming. <laughs> so, and, you know, astronomers love this stuff, and anthropologists love it also, this kind of idea of, of how we uh, cultures view their relationship to the cosmos, but then also how that translates into um, their, their burial rites and how they view um, the seasons. But it also has a very practical standpoint. I mean, um, the, practic the practicality of this, of this instrument for them is an, is an observatory. This is an astronomical observatory for the Neolithic peoples of, of Ireland to tell them when spring is coming, to tell them when to get their seeds ready and when to plant, and when um, they might, uh, how long they should expect to hold out for the winter and, 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 and what's gonna happen next in their lives. Sorry, there was a question. My solstice is mess messed up. So, so the, the the question was um, w was why is it the winter solstice instead of the spring solstice? When uh, sorry, I don't. Why would you expect the, the spring solstice? Or summer, oh, sorry, summer solstice. Yeah. So the, the yeah. So the, so the reason the the winter solstice is is the one that's used is that's that end point of where that of the sun is stopping and it's going to reverse the motion in the sky. So it's it's a it's a clear motion it's a clear right right it, you can do the same experiment here in Maui you can watch the sun move along the horizon at sunrise at uh, particular times of the year in the winter you'll you'll see it set um, towards Lanai and in the in the summertime it'll be closer to Molokai. <laughs> Uh, right, they they wouldn't know the time of day other than, other than the sunrise and the length of the day. There was no clock, sundial. They could plot out. Yeah, and if you were really one who was wanting accuracy, like the British were in, in the 18th century, you could make that correction of the analemma of, of when you see the shadow in a particular area, you can say that the shadow hits this particular point, you can add 10, 15 minutes to it, and this is the actual time. And that's the kind of accuracy the British did in the 18th century. Anyway, so uh, it's not only Ireland, it's, it's, it's all the place, I mean, it's Stonehenge. Stonehenge has astronomical alignment with the solstice is also, this is uh, an Indian site in the Southwest Pueblo area for uh, Native Americans. The pyramids in, in Egypt are um, considered by some to be astronomically aligned. Um, so the sun is constantly in this cultural place of significance and importance in our lives. It, it continues. In Egypt, of course, we start to get into the ideas of, of the sun being a body itself and a god that one should worship. So the Egypts had the, the, the sun king Ra. Um, in the left, you can see the hieroglyphics. The, uh, the um, Incas in South America, Machu Picchu, uh, used their site at their highest sacred mountaintop to 
uh, to serve as an astronomical observatory and actually um, try to capture the sun at, a, at its height so that they could link, so that they could get the most out of the, out of the Sunday and have a longest day. So they, they would wait for the sun to get it to the highest in the year and then they would try to grab it down. Um, that has a very large symbol, uh, 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 analogy to, to Maui, you'll see in a second. Um, there were, in, in Buddhist cultures, you have a, have a similar sun king. I forget his name now. Um, this is Taiyang Shen, the Chinese solar deity. Um, in Hindus' cultures, you also have uh, Zun, Siru, and in the Mayans, uh, you, you have uh, similar sun gods. Um, but to, to bring it back home a little bit, now we can talk a little bit about Hawaiian cultures and, and our connection with this, um, Hawaiian culture connection with the sun. And this is a, something that I, uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't know much about until this last week and I got excited about it. Um, but in Hawaiian culture, we have the, the ancient chief deity, Maui. Maui was, a, was a, a revered chief who is considered the father of the island. So one of, one of the things that Maui did was he took his brothers, he was known as a trickster, and he said he was gonna take his brothers out onto a, uh, onto a canoe for some fishing with his mighty great Maui fish hook that you see pictures and tattoos and, and license plates of. And he went out and his brothers didn't know what he was doing, but he said, paddle, 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 you'll, you'll be fine, you know, Amua. And he put his hook out and with his hook, he hooked the ocean floor and he pulled up an island. His brothers didn't notice it, so they kept going, paddle, paddle, paddle. They thought it was getting a little heavy, but they, you know, they were tough. They kept going, he threw it out another one, and he created another island. You get the idea. The Hawaiian chain is, is Maui pulling up the ocean floor into these volcanoes. But Maui did something else. He, he had, a, had a, his mother, Hina, who one day came to him and, he, and said that her, her cloth was having a hard time drying because this, the days were not long enough. This is the same problem that the Incans were having probably with their harvests or wheat or something, some need for this long Sunday to get their, their, their work done and their harvests in. And so Hino went up to Maui and said, I need you to make the sun um, stay in the sky longer. So Maui, uh, again, the trickster, decided he was going to hike up with his brothers up to the top of the, of the house of the sun, Haleakala, uh, Haleakala, um, Haleakala uh, to rope down the sun. So these are artists' uh, artists' uh, conceptions of this process of him going up to rope the sun. Some people say it's some type of cane ropes that he used. Some people say they were magical ropes. Some some claim that it was his sister's hair braided that he used. He went up to the top of the mountain and he roped the sun, pulled it in, and had a conversation with the sun. He said, he didn't, "I don't I don't want to hurt you. I just want you to stay in the in the in the in the sky longer." And the sun said, "No." He said, okay, now I'll hurt you. <laughs> so he took his great fish hook and his great iron uh, bone into the sun and started penetrating and wounding the sun. And it is this wounded sun that makes the sun so long and wondrous um, uh, across the Maui sky. And in fact, some people say that the, the sunbeams coming out of the sun are the magical ropes or the sister's hair still coming down. Or other people say that that fish hook and that that blade, whenever it went into the sun, it wounded him and this it, the, made him bleed. And the beautiful sunrise that we get is the, is the sun bleeding for, for Hawaii. So we've, we've come a long way and we, we've seen a little bit that throughout the, throughout the centuries we have tuned our existence to this orbital relationship with the sun and the heat. It seasons farming, rebirth, culture, uh, the, the cultural connection. Um, but at some point I have to get a little bit more scientific and tell you really why I'm here. And that is that the seasons of our lives were and, and are based on the orbital seasons. Nothing is gonna change that. But the story goes on, and that's where I wanna change onto now. Um, the story now goes to 1859, not that long ago, to an observatory with a couple of amateur astronomers in England um, named Richard Carrington and Richard Hodson, who on the 1st of September in 1859 were looking at the sun, the sun which many th still at those days considered to be a, a uniform uh, a, a gas ball. He was looking at sunspots, these weird things that Galileo in the, in the 17th century had found for the, for the Catholic Church and, and other people had been tracking 
and he start, he he was really looking at it, and there was no CCD cameras in this day. There was there was not film to create movies in these days. So he was actively sitting there with an eyepiece or with his projection on the sun, looking at the at the um, these sunspots. And what he saw and what he drew in September first was this being the sun. This is a dark area of a sunspot with this kind of a, a cooler region around it, which is what sunspots normally look like. But then he drew these little hooks here, these white brightening bright points. This is the very first observation of a solar flare um, in history. And to date, it's the biggest solar flare ever recorded in history. That's the reason he could see it. It was so prominent that he could see it in white light without any, spec any spectral analysis, no e e UV uh, uh, filters, nothing at all. He could see it with his bare eye. He could see the flare going off. This is something that doesn't happen very often. Um, but again, this is not the first time sunspots were measured, but this is the first time a flare was measured, and this was a, was a very special one. Um, but going back a little bit, Galileo was the one who first really started the systematic measure of sunspots. And it was in 1610, roughly, that he turned his scope to, this, to the sun, and um, so the telescope was newly born then. Astronomy was rapidly developing. He was uh, measuring the Galilean satellites around Jupiter, but he was also looking at the paths of these dark things on the sun. And this is one of his drawings back in the 17th century of the illuminated sphere with some dark areas, patchy sunspots around. And he saw these dark areas on the sun and he thought that they were just some dark clouds. Yep, question in the back. <laughs> so, so the question was, it was a trial, or, a trial and error that led to someone learning that they shouldn't stare at the sun too long, otherwise their eyes might burn and their retinas will be scarred. Um, no, uh, in fact, um, in the early days, what Galileo would do and other astronomers would do would, would be to project an image onto something else, like a wall or onto a piece of wood, and then they could see the reflected light off of that. And this is the same technique that we've used in telescopes for centuries now, to not burn our eyes before CCDs. We project it onto a screen and then we look at the scattered light off of that. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to look through Galileo's telescope, he had other eye problems. <laughs> uh, which, uh, it's in Florence, Italy, if you have every chance, it's, it's awesome. Question here. same way, and, and pinhole cameras. Uh, so the gentleman here was talking about uh, projection of, of the solar surface and during the, uh, during the transit of Venus so that you could see it onto a piece of paper. And um, that same techniques can be, can be used um, using pinhole cameras or uh, even leaves in a, in a tree during a solar eclipse. You can see some imaging effects uh, that are really neat. Uh, anyhow, Gal Galileo was looking at the sunspots and he thought they were dark clouds. Um, this is this is the beginning of systematic studies of sunspots, but it wasn't the first sunspot observations. Even before the telescope and the systematic start, uh, systematic study of sunspots started, there were there were uh, reports of these these type of things. This is from John of Worcester in England, uh, his Chronicles in 1128, where he describes this enormous black area on the sun. I'm assuming that this is the size of the sun, and this is the area of the sunspot filling up what in relation to the sun would be about four Jupiters across. Um, he saw this as others in, in um, early China and around the globe saw that through the thick haze of clouds. You know, if, if you have a really large sunspot, as we did last October actually here in Maui, if you have a right filter, if you have a cloud, if you have a haze, if you have a neutral density filter, you can stand outside and you can look at a sunspot if it's this big. Um, Anyhow, we want to get back to Richard Carrington and that flare, and s to, to get into his mindset, we got to understand what was the knowledge of the solar cycle at this point. At this point, um, in 1859, people were making uh, systematic studies of sunspots since Galileo, and a German astronomer named Schwab um, was, criti uh, was of critical value in this study. And in 1843, he, he published a little report that said that after he had watched sunspots for 17 years, after every day watching for 17 years, 
over and over and over again, looking for patterns, not really knowing what they were, just doing his astronomy. After 17 years, he realized that the number of sunspots waxed and waned over the years. And we now call this the solar cycle. So this is back in his, in his period, and this, is, this blue line is the number of sunspots versus time. So you can see the number of sunspots growing and decaying, growing and decaying, on average about every 11 years. Um, so Richard Carrington knew about these observations, and he and he knew that the sun had these had these seasons going on, um, but he didn't have the piece, the connection of why these might be important. I mean, if you look at reports from uh, William Herschel, another famous astronomer, he he thought that sunspots, all that they were, were breaks in the clouds that you could look down at the solar inhabitants who were living on the planetary surface of the sun. Um, that's not the case. Instead, these are very uh, high sinks of energy, or high, high, high uh, wells of energy, um, of magnetic energy. But he didn't, he didn't know the influence here. So going back to the storm, these little white brightenings that he saw in 1859, he, he had tracked these for numerous days. This was the biggest one he saw. And what he had saw, seen was, was what Schwab had seen, what Galileo was seeing, was that there was numerous sunspots on the sun at a given time. And this time period between August 28th and se September 2nd, there was a lot. There was a numerous and they were large. And then he found this flare. Okay, so what, what, was, what made this observation so special other than the fact that this was something new that he was seeing? Well, it came in the news later that at the same time that this was happening on the sun, there was an enormous geomagnetic storm occurring on Earth at the same time. So this... These are observations from Greenwich Observatory, London, um, or Greenwich, rather. And this is the deviation of a compass needle in the Earth's magnetic field over time throughout the days. This is August 27th. And what you can see is some smooth deviations uh, with a little activity here, smooth peaks, big disruption, smooth again. September 3rd, two days after Carrington saw his flare, Enormous <laughs> disruption, magnetic field on the su on the Earth was going haywire, going crazy. Uh, it should be they're the same, they're the same instrument. I can check on it, but it, uh, I can't tell right now either. Yeah. Uh, but so there was this huge geomagnetic storm that people had seen before. They were associated with these brightenings in the northern hemisphere called aurora that they had had been witnessing for centuries. Um, there were some geomagnetic, geomagnetic phenomena that wasn't understood, or at least I don't know wh what the understanding at that time was for what this activity. Question here. What was the point of measuring magnetism in the 18th century? Uh, that's a good question. I'm gonna, so the question was, what was the point of measuring magnetism in the 18th century? And, and there was, I think someone was maybe going to comment on that. That's true, yeah, and uh, so, so the comment was uh, the, the geomatic next storm was happening at a time when telegraph machines were being disrupted also, and we'll get to that, but so why were they me measuring the, ge the geomagnetic forces or these storms at that time? Um, I'm not gonna speculate, I, I could come up with a couple of reasons, but I, I, I don't know offhand, I'm sorry. <laughs> So a lovely chap <laughs> from, I think, a northern country just said that they uh, needed a, a compass to uh, travel the world around uh, because the deviation of the comp compass was important to navigation, and I think that is clearly correct. Um, so uh, not only there was a geomagnetic storm, but then there was this haywire going on with the telegraph machines. Telegraph systems all over Europe and North America started to fail and or catch fire around this week in, uh, in August and September. Some telegraph uh, operators, they found that they could send their signals without using any electrical power. There was, there was some current, some electricity, something that could carry their signals going on in the earth at that time that could get their signal from here to there without using any electricity. That was the power of what was going on in the earth at that time. Um, so what, what's next is auroras. And again, I, I want to understand better 
what people thought of auroras back then. I, I must admit I, I'm naive there, but auroras were certainly reported routinely in the northern latitudes. But on this day, it was a very special event. Auroras were reported all across the globe in many, many areas. Um, and it's, it's some very special observations came out of this. Um, the, the aurora usually, you know, to see an aurora even as, as north of London is, um, is sometimes a rare event because most of them are higher than that, the, uh, the aurora of influence for the aurora. But to see something south is a very, very rare phenomenon. But they were all over the place. And here's a report um, from the Baltimore American and Commercial Advertiser on 3rd September 1859. And I'm going to get historical here, forgive me, but I kind of felt historical this week. So I'm going to read this. Uh, so the advertiser says, those who happened to be out late on Thursday night had an opportunity of witnessing another magnificent display of the aurora lights. The phenomenon was very similar to dis the display on Sunday night, though at times the light was, if possible, more brilliant and the prismatic hues more varied and gorgeous. The light appeared to cover, cover the whole firmament, apparently like a luminous cloud through which the stars of the larger magnitude indistinctively shone. So this cloud was so bright that the stars, they were having a hard time seeing the stars at night. The light was, gr and, and this is 1859, this is not Baltimore today, just so you know. <laughs> the, so the light was greater even than that of the moon at its full, but had an indescribable softness and delicacy that seemed to en envelop everything upon which it rested. Between 12 and 1 o'clock, when the display was at its full brilliancy, the quiet streets of the city resting under this strange light presented a beautiful as well as singular appearance. Uh, would have been a beautiful night to be in Baltimore, apparently. But what's crazy was that this same event was seen in Hawaii. And this is phenomenal. I mean, has anybody seen the Northern Lights in Hawaii? <laughs> no. <laughs> in fact, I did find the Hawaiian word for aurora, but... I don't believe that it's accurate. <laughs> I don't know. It, it was really hard to find any information on this. And what led me to some news articles in an old newspaper in Honolulu was a scientific journal that was um, uh, written by a guy named Loomis. Right after the Carrington flare, he went around and he collected all these um, eyewitness accounts of what was going around the globe to, to get some kind of synthesis of what happened on this week in 1859. And one of the things that he was pointed out to was these uh, um, articles in the Pacific Commercial Advertiser, which was the predecessor of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Um, so this is, you can see, September 8, 1859. And there were two entries that Loomis had, had reported about in the 19th century. One was this original article in eight, September 8, which the editor said, Northern Lights, there was quite a display of the aurora borealis a few nights since, visible in Honolulu. Broad, fiery streaks shot up into and played among the heavens almost as beautifully as those which are sometimes in the more uh, seen in more northern climes. Um, imagine uh, someone in Hawaii never been to the north um, reading this. They probably didn't know what it even was about. But there was a guy in Lahaina um, who didn't know what it was about. There was a guy named S.E. Bishop. You can see his tag here. And he says the next week, September 9th, from Lahaina, Mr. Editor, the appearance of the aurora borealis in tropical latitude is just so unusual that all the facts may well be known for scientific inquiry. Beautiful that a man in Lahaina, when he could be at the beach, was thinking about scientific inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me feel justified. Anyway, your statement, which I just read, that the aurora was seen in Honolulu, enabled me at once to account for the phenomenon I observed a few nights here since. At 10 p.m., I noticed a bright, unsteady, crimson glow upon the sky, extending from northeast to north, about 30 degrees in altitude. It resembled the reflection of a great conflagration of 20 or 30 miles distance. Not thinking aurora lights in these latitudes, and for want of any better hypothesis, I attribute it to heavy fires on the other side of the mountain. <laughs> Assuming that this is Wailuku from crazy parties. Anyway as such ravaged the country. I, I was pu puzzled, however, by the fact that the clouds which r rested on the mountain and were scattered around and beyond it did not give the slightest reflection of the supposed fire. I should say that the light was far too pure and rich a crimson to have been caused by a fire. Very truly yours, S.E. Bishop. So these two reports were, were gathered by Loomis back in the 19th century, and this was reports at 18, 19 degree latitude in, in, here on Hawaii 
very low sightings for the aurora, un unseen since. Um, and this down here below, you, you can't read it here, but this is the editor saying basically, great, we need to further these observations and anybody who saw this, anybody has a report on the other side of the mountain, please get in and, and tell us anything about it. But everybody went to the beach and nobody knew anything. <laughs> so that's where Loomis left it and that's the story of Aurora in Hawaii. Up until, I'm excited about this because last week I was digging around in these newspapers and I learned that the UH Manoa Hamilton Library just two years ago received a grant from, um, well I have it written here, uh, they received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to digitize 100,000 pages of historic Hawaii newspapers. And these d these copies were presumably on microfilm somewhere, but not easily accessed and not uh, accessible to a point where I would go in and, and look for them. But now these are all on the uh, on the web, and you can go and you can look at these old newspapers, and they're fascinating if you if you ever have a chance. Anyway, the, there was an issue from the 1st of October 2015, which to me contains a new account not found in any sol solar historic records, and it's an important one, I think. And I say it's, it's not anywhere because as far as I'm aware, I haven't, haven't seen it in the literature anywhere. But this is, again, October 1st, so a couple weeks, uh, a whole month after the event. And this is the um, editor. <laughs> oh! I know. <laughs> so for you, uh, for you at home, <laughs> it was pointed out that 2015 was not when this paper came out. October 1st, 1859. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I should have had some coffee whenever I was writing this slide. <laughs> right. I mean, I said it's a new account. <laughs> it's, it's in press. <laughs> Anyway, so this is the, the editor uh, chiming in about a month after his original report, and now it says, the Aurora Borealis again, the third report. Boy, t so much effort here. Uh, anyhow, the, the, ca the California papers, he says, has, have, been f have been full of accounts of magnificent Aurora Borealis witnessed by the people of that state several times during the last week of August. On the evening of the 4th of September, a display of the same kind, but of a comparably feeble characteristic was witnessed in Honolulu. But we now learn from a Captain Foss of the Kinoli that on the evening of September 2nd at about 10 and a half o'clock in latitude 12 degrees north, longitude 117, 19 west, he beheld a similar expedition, e exhibition. He says the log states that they saw a very bright light to the northward, reaching nearly to the zenith and extending around the horizon a distance of 50 degrees. The light was too bright for a ship on fire and it was thought possible that it might be of volcanic origin. The idea of such a display of the Aurora Borealis in so southerly a latitude never occurring to the captain until he was informed after his return of the unusual exhibitions that occurred at nearly the same date in California and the Hawaiian Islands. So 12 degrees latitude, this is the furthest south on record as far as I know and it's, it's, a fan it's really cool that you can go back and do this kind of archaeological solar physics. Um, anyway, so I've been going about 50 minutes, and we're not going to get to modern times, but uh, just too much. But let's let's key in on some some findings that we're seeing here. The influence of the 1859 solar storms. Carrington had suspected for a while that there might be a solar terrestrial connection. He didn't know what sunspots were. He saw the cycles. He saw geomagnetic storms, but there was no connection. But Carrington saw this, and he looked at it and he, and he said that this was enough. This was enough to firmly establish the connection between solar events and terrestrial activity. Um, what we've seen is that geomagnetic storms have real consequences on our modern globe, modern being 1859, now even more so. Um, and this, this is only witnessed by these telegraph uh, observations and, and ship compasses and whatnot. What's furthermore is this 1859 flare is the largest storm on record. Um, even today, there's nothing that surpasses it. So what these kind of observations led to is the fortification of the need to study solar seasons and the sunspot cycle and their influence with us as we progress into modern society. And what this has led to is, is a record now that we look at um, routinely 
a record that is one of the longest astronomical records to date. And what we have now is 400 years of sunspot observations. And you look back over the many cycles, back to even Galileo's time, 1601, you can see this undula or modulating influence of solar cycles, these seasons of the suns. Um, these, of course, are a lot of historical uh, um, accounts. Modern observations, uh, drawings and things didn't come back, it come until the 18th, 19th century. Um, we didn't know much about sunspots before then, but you can, just from this long record, you can see some surprising things. First of all, you can see how regular the cycle is. It's about 11 years. Second of all, you can see something that's really weird right at the beginning. And this is a time called the Maunder Minimum. And this was, um, this was a period in history right after Galileo started his observations, his systematic observations, look, looking at sunspots that sunspots didn't appear much. So in this time, whenever you see only a few sunspots and you don't see any cycles, and the cycle wasn't even uh, uh, discovered in 18, until 1843, this would be a very confusing time. Um, but now we look back and, and, and there's people in solar physics who dive into records throughout many different cultures, many different libraries, looking at eyewitness account. And the statistics and everything are clear that this time of the sun's hi history was lower in its activity than modern times. Question in the back. Right, so this is the, this is the really interesting thing. Um, Carrington, you know, he, 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 he saw the influence, or he proje projected the influence of, uh, of solar activity on the terrestrial world. Um, however, this was, this was not necessarily the first suggestion of this. So the first question was that um, in the modern minimum, there might there's also a time called the, minimum, uh, the, the little ice age. Um, and this is a time in, in Europe when temperatures were fairly cold and it coincides with this, this period of history. Um, so there was, there was a time even before Carrington when Herschel, again, the person who thought people were living on the sun, suggested that, that the number of sunspots influenced the wheat prices in Europe. Right. So he, he suggested that maybe there was, an, there was enough dark material on the sun that there was not enough bright, or there was not enough light for the, for the wheat to produce well. So if you have more sunspots, the sun's darker, wheat's not very good, and the price goes up, goes to the supply. Um, Herschel, as brilliant of a man he was, he was wrong. <laughs> he was wrong again because, in fact, the sun is not darker when there are more sunspots. The sun is brighter. So when there's more dark material in the sun, there's actually more light coming from it. And this is because of very small features around the sun that increases the luminosity. So in this time period, very few sunspots, that corresponds with a darker sun, less light, maybe you could correlate then the influence of sunspots with climate. And people have done this, and, and people go wild with, with this idea. I mean, in London, in this time, they were having festivals on the Thames when Tem the Thames flood bank would, would freeze over in the wintertime. Um, th this, is, this is a piece of solar, uh, of, uh, of solar influence on our climate system that is really, um, uh, tightly researched, and there's not a consensus, in my opinion, uh, on, on whether that correlation is really causal yet. Um, but the other thing I want to mention, just because it's a cool anecdote, was that in this particular time, also, Little Ice Age, that was cold in Europe, there was a man named Stradivarius who was making violins. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the craziest correlations, I think, in my mind, and I, and I love it because my, my wife is a, a musician, and I can tell her that my my work has some influence on hers, but some people said the Little Ice Age was this time so um, so cold in Europe that the the trees that grew during that time had to grow very tight little condensed rings around it, made it for a very dense wood, and that made the beautiful hollow or the beautiful resonant sounds of Stradivarius' violins. <laughs> So what you, 
can see already how clearly important it is for us to study the historical record of the sun. But it, it can be uh, hard fought because modern observations and our understanding of the sun progresses all the time. And, you know, we didn't discover even that the sunspot had a magnetic field until 1908. We didn't have the, the tools really to routinely measure those magnetic fields until the 50s. And we didn't have CCD cameras until the late 60s and 70s. And they weren't routinely used in astronomy until the 80s. So the great characterization of the solar cycles happens all in the modern era. But the interesting things that are happening on long cycles are happening back when we don't have records. So this, there's this mixture of looking at the archives, looking at the reports, but then somehow trying to correlate those with modern records, w making the postulate that that even makes sense, that we can take what's going on in the sun right now and somehow extrapolate what's going on in the back. And that's something that we, we don't have a good handle with. Um, we can use tree rings, we can use ice cores, but the linearness of that relationship between these variables and what happened in those times is, is not that easy to, to establish. Um, so I think as I've been going on for an hour, anytime you want to, again, uh, interject, let me know. But uh, I'll just wrap up with a, a few quick observations of the sun now, what we kind of know. And I'll, I'll go through this very quickly. Um, the sun now is routinely observed from space, from the ground, by astronomers all around the world. This um, endeavor of importance of the sun, both as an astronomical um, Rosetta Stone to, to unlock the secrets of the, of the universe through other stars, but also the importance of this as, as a solar terrestrial driver um, is, is, is a bond that unites cultures across the globe and that every, every de uh, developed nation is, is seeking more understanding of. So more pictures of the sun are taken every day than you would even imagine. So this, the, these, uh, these images are from the HMI helioseismic imager experiment on board the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which is up in a geosynchronous order, orbit above the, um, uh, above the Earth. And it takes an image like, th um, uh, like this, one every, uh, see this instrument, it's about one every eight seconds. And it does it 24 hours a day, and it's been doing it for six years. And this is two cameras for this instrument, and there's four, five, six, at least six cameras on the, on the spacecraft. So it's millions and millions and millions of images. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anybody wants to see my desk, there's hard drives stacked up this high full of data. Question in the back. Right. So uh, uh, the question was about a um, the observatory in space that gives us a 3D perspective of the sun. How 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 well do we ha have a coverage across the whole 360s um, sphere of the of the sun? And the the instrument that I have here is actually one that doesn't do that. This is a um, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which is always with us on Earth, orbiting Earth. But there's another set of NASA satellites that are a pair of satellites called Stereo, which are orbiting slightly uh, ahead and behind in Earth's orbit at uh, further and shorter distances from the sun, which means that these satellites, due to, again, Kepler's third law, um, will mean that the satellites progressively get further apart and then wrap around the sun. So at particular times in their lifetime, you get different angles of the, of the sun that we can't get from Earth. And right now, um, stereo is in a position where you can actually get a full 3D picture of what's going on in the sun. So we can see what's going on on the back side of the surface now. Um, and the lifetime of that observatory, I don't know how long it is, but it's still going. And, and I believe that they're starting to con converge back on the back side. But once it gets on the back side, the real challenge is going to be data rates because of the distance it takes the data to travel from, that, from the back side of the surface, or the back side of the sun to us again. Um, and the interference from the sun. So, all of these observatories that are in space have to deal with the same, si the same climate, the solar effects that we deal with on Earth, but uh, many multi magnitude more. So they're affected by what they're trying to study. Question right here.
are you employed? Can I, can, I, <laughs> can I hire you? That's a great idea. You know what? They're doing that on Mars. The rovers that are on the surface of Mars, they uh, tr um, reflect the signal from the rovers on Mars through satellites around Mars and back to us. So, so the young, young man up here, uh, for those of you here, said that why don't we use a, an additional set of satellites to um, to transmit or uh, reflect the the signals from the backside of the surface or backside of the sun, so we get a stronger signal, and we can do that. Uh, you have to just grow up and build it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now we. Now we get to see the sun in its full, full glory from space because not only do we see it in the visible and infrared, but we get to see it now in the UV channels. In the UV channels, we're seeing hot gases that are, that are brightened above the active regions up to millions of degrees Kelvin. So the material that you're looking at here, particularly in the left image in um, this uh, UV band at 171 angstroms, is the solar corona at about a million degrees above active regions, so underneath here, there's pockets of magnetic field that are associated with sunspots. On the right-hand side, you see some cooler material that's a little below that in, in the, in, in the mega, um, tens of kilokelvin uh, range of the chromosphere where you get to see massive uh, areas that are over the sun. These dark features here and here are um, reflected of big mass regions called prominences, which is another uh, thing of solar influence. Um, so if you look at EUV illumination across the solar cycle, this is kind of what the sun looks like in hot gas. So this is from 96 to 2006 from the um, MDI or Yoko, I forget uh, which instrument. But 96 was at this minimum period when the sunspots, there were not that many, solar minimum. In the EUV, you don't get there much hot gas. But then as you go throughout the solar cycle at its max in 2001 and two and three, you get to see this brightly illuminated solar surface, which is that this hot gas being triggered by activity going on in the sun. Um, occasionally the sun burps <laughs> big gases, big, big masses of gas called prominences and, and coronal mass ejection. So this is one um, from the Solar Dynamics Ob Observatory showing a big cloud of gas um, being ejected from the, uh, the solar surface. Um, just roughly, I'd, I'd say that have a good trick, but uh, on order of 10 Jupiters across here in terms of size. It's enormous. So remember, uh, for those who want a sense of scale, the sun, you can fit, if you, if you stack Earths up, you can fit 110 Earths across this, the surface if you put Earths end to end. So the sun is very big. It's an it's it's incredible. They're they're beautiful if they weren't so dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, right here. Question. Relative us, it's a big big deal. But yeah, you're right. <laughs> so the the the, the 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 point was that this. So the the the, the point the, the comment was that the the sun is. Is uh, is big to us, but not not necessarily that special in terms of size in the galaxy. And um, the sun is, of course, uh, you're giving it a C minus. So the the sun, of course, is a is a middle aged star. It's kind of boring to a lot of astronomers. Um, well, it used to be. Now it turns out they're very useful for uh, looking around for extra solar planets. <laughs> in, in addition to those burps of mass, you have burps of energy, and they, these are the modern solar flare observations from UV spectrographs or UV filter graph instruments. So what what Carrington saw in these little bitty ribbons, these little white things, this was what was going on in the UV. 
huge brightening that the detector of the CCD actually bleeds out and saturates, and all of these, all, all of those photons start to, to mix across the CCD. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> So uh, there's there's much 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 we can say about the activity of the sun, but I, I want to get just a few few influences real quick before I finish up here. And one is we we've looked at this UV uh, changes throughout the solar cycle, and that UV can be mapped by spectrographs. Now this is a couple different spectrographs ma mapping the amount of UV flux that they have in certain channels across many solar solar cycles. And what you can see is that it modulates um, over these three solar cycles significantly. This UV flux uh, has a very important influence on the Earth that Carrington didn't even understand. Um, and one that's very important for anything that's in your pocket right now, maybe your cell phone or, or your credit card or, or your GPS or whatever. That importance is this UV doesn't get to us in large amounts unless it hits you on your sun. On your on your beach day, and you get sunburned, right? A lot of that is absorbed in the in the ozone layer, up in the upper upper reaches of our own atmosphere in the thermosphere. That absorption adds heat into our atmosphere. That heat generates a larger density structure and a larger um, uh, amount of mass extended away from the Earth. And usually, if you think about outside of the Earth, you think about vacuum, and you don't think of much. But um, there are a lot of things out there. And some of them are things that don't like particles hitting them. And, and these things are satellites. So this is just a, a silly diagram of a satellite 400 or 500 kilometers up showing kind of the effects of what happens if you have something not in vacuum but some material that's going to impede the, the motion of the satellite going forward. Any type of in increased density or pressure is going to restrict its motion. That restrict motion is going to make it go slower. That slowed motion is going to make it decay. That satellite is then going to burn up into the into the atmosphere of, the, of, our, of our Earth. Question. Yeah, it's an amazing technology. So the young man brought up solar sails that, that NASA is, is starting to develop to, to be able to harness solar wind and also photon energy to, to push things out into further space. But right now, um, that's in the near, in the future. Right now, what happens with these satellites is if you're a satellite company interested in keeping your satellite in space, you either have to put enough fuel on this thing to, to push it back up whenever the satellite comes back down from the drag or you have to keep enough satellites in your pocket that you can just keep throwing them up. But what's important is that is is that this cycles, right? Over the cycle. And one cycle is bigger than the next. This one is particularly weird. You see a really low low minimum here for this last solar cycle in 2010. The it's inking back up and it's actually returned a little bit. But the amount of drag on satellites is tightly correlated with how much UV flux is being put out by the sun. So if you're an insurance agent or someone who wanted to invest in a satellite company, or if you were a satellite company wanting to measure how much risk you have in the next century for your satellites that are costing a couple hundred million a piece or a couple tens of million a piece, you want to know what's happening here. So this is one of the, one of the reasons that people like me and other people are employed pragmatically, despite our despite our, our love for just looking at the things. Um, another thing is that these flares uh, not only mess up telegraphs, now they, now they have shown that they mess up other things in the earth, and this is our power grid. These electric currents that you're sending your signals across in, the, in 1859 on the telegraph, these electric currents are giving us power to this room. And when a solar storm hits, these currents can int introduce a, um, an overcharge into uh, into the power grid, and it, can, and it can make it blow. So there was a great flare in March 18, er, in, in 1989 that this happened. So this is the, the northeast seacoast of, uh, or Atlantic coast of uh, um, 
the US, of course, Florida down here, New York, Boston, huge lights. This is the city lights at night. And this is observations from 1989 of what happened on that night when a solar flare went off. <laughs> so y you could imagine just what chaos would happen in this in this case. I mean, what our our relying our reliance on on the electric grid is now more than we ever relied on the sun for the seasons, and this is something that's very serious. Question. In some cases, that's true. Some cases, it's not. It depends on the design, and people are getting better and better at doing we doing this. So, so the concern was what what efforts are being put forward to 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 prevent this type of thing to happen with our grids in the in the future, and and a lot of engineering is being put into making it res uh, restrictive, or uh, sorry, more resilient. Question. Well, uh, let me get, uh, so the question is, um, do we have a good understanding of what the underlying physics is that generates a solar cycle so that we can predict these things? Um, let me get to that in two slides. I'll get it, sir. Um, but uh, l let me finish a couple slides and then we'll, we'll move to more questions here in a, in a minute, whoever wants to stick around. Anyhow, th this, is, this is a very important effect. And the question then is, even though I haven't justified that that 1859 flare was the largest ever on record, it is. Um, what if that happened today? Well, l first of all, if it happened today, it would look <laughs> sort of like this in a modern observation. This is what Carrington drew. This is what uh, HMI, uh, I believe it HMI or, or Hinodi saw on a, on, a, on a sunspot, these little white ribbons. But that one is a lot more powerful than this one, and we know that just from the terrestrial record. But Lloyd's of London, which is an insurance company, I believe, and other philanthropies, um, went about this exercise a few years ago to estimate what the co cost of the destruction would be of this one flare going off. This flare that happened only 150 years ago, how much would it cost right now? And it's 0.6 to 2.6 trillion dollars. Um, I'm not trying to argue that you should employ me. <laughs> All I'm trying to say is that this is important. And, and that it's it's something going forward that we need to understand more about, and I and I hope more people get in, in, in interested in it. So back to your question, sir, of what do we understand about the physics of the solar cycle? It depends on who you ask. There are many people who think that they've solved the problem. Many people think that they've projected it, and they've predicted it, they know what the solar cycle is going to be. Um, they put out papers um, saying that it's going to do such a thing. Other people put out papers that say they're wrong. Um, I'm usually in the second part of that because I'm conservative natured. But uh, here's a paper from 2008 back in the solar minimum when people thought the sunspots weren't going to come back because it was so low we hadn't seen anything going on in a while. And people started putting out projections for what the next solar cycle was. And their prediction was based on what the greatest number of sunspots is going to be for that cycle. Here's all the papers, all the journal articles. And every one of them, if you go in, they can make an argument for them knowing the physics, or some argument. Some predicted down below 40 for the number of sunspots. This is a weighted number. Some predicted to be about 180. For re uh, to register this, this is about the smallest sunspot cycle you've ever seen on record. This is about the biggest. <laughs> so you tell me if we know uh, enough. <laughs> Again, to keep my job, I'd say we're doing better than Vegas. <laughs> and um, so I, I think I'll end it here, but, but the, the, the exciting things coming forward is, is really getting to the physics. And, and if you have a chance to come and see another talk, I know Andre Feldman gave a talk about some of the instruments a few months ago, and there's going to be a lot more talking about uh, the Daniel K in a new A solar telescope. IFA is building two of the instruments that are going in this telescope that's being built on Haleakala right now. And, and this is going to be our view, uh, our eyepiece 
in the future for the tiniest pieces of magnetism on the sun and w what their effect is. What is your personal involvement with the uh, particular project? Yeah, so, so the reason I moved here, the reason I, I, I am here is to work with the IFA on this instrument called DL NERSP. This is the diffraction limited near infrared spectropolarimeter. And in fact, the, the new released image of, of what the instrument inside the, inside, the sun, inside the telescope looked like, this is what it is. And basically what I'm building is this thing, all of this. So this is the, the, the light coming down from the telescope and this is a segment of mirrors that we, we do to re-image and then this is enormous spectrograph with three cameras inside it. So this is what Haosheng Lin and I and our team is building. Jeff Kuhn and, and, and Andre and his team at the IFA are, are building CryoNurse, which is this, what Jeff calls a coffin size instrument. <laughs> Um, how about this? Um, so I'll get to your I'll get to your question. I, I've been going on now. I see uh, an hour and twenty. So I think I want to wrap up for anybody who wants to get home. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I'll go forward if if if. if, if. Uh, okay, uh, well, uh, how about this? Let me. Uh, uh, there's a segment about this instrument that I'd like to talk about. I have a few slides and a few movies and things that we can say. Um, but, but let me get to my point and get to the ending so that people who want to go home and can go. Um, so so I, I kind of return back to this importance of the sun, and I think we've seen some of the effects and, and some of the importance over history. And... and, and to me, the impact of the sun still is both not my, my job, but also still going back to that sunset every day. And I, I kind of like to start or end this formal part of it as I finished. N not, well, it was my idea all from the start, but then I got a better idea whenever I, I looked at the Pacific uh, Advertiser and I saw this northern light thing. And then I read up here, it said, the Dashaways, um, on Saturday evening, a lecture was delivered before the Dashaways, this is in Hawaii, the lecture, which was an excellent one, <laughs> was concluded by a poem, descriptive of the rise and progress of the institution, abounding in happy sallies of wit and hum humorous allusions, which kept his audience in a tumult of laughter from the commencement to the close. I can't promise you that, but I, I do have another Robert Louis Stevenson poem that I, I finish up with and uh, maybe uh, put people to sleep if you're headed home. And this one is called The Sun Travels. Um, so The Sun Travels by Robert Louis Stevenson. The sun is not a bed when I, at night upon my pillow lie. Still round the earth he takes, his way he takes, and morning after morning makes. While here at home in shining day, we round the sunny garden play. Each little Indian sleepy head is being kissed and put to bed. And when at eve I rise from tea, day dawns beyond the Atlantic Sea. And all the children in the west are getting up and being dressed. Um, anyhow, I like that one. <laughs> anyhow, before I go back and take more people's time, I, I, I take this chance right now to say thank you very much for your attentiveness uh, and your listening and, and for allowing me to, to do my historic kind of uh, digging through historical solar physics for a bit. Um, yeah, so thanks. Thank you. You want to see it? <laughs> uh, so, so briefly, we'll go into this. Um, the, the Daniel K. in a new solar telescope has been a long time coming, and what it is is a is a telescope that's bigger than anything we've ever built for solar physics. It's it's what someone has said. I forget who said it. It's 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 more impactful for solar physics now. It's a it's as big of an impact now for solar physics as Galileo's first telescope. It's that, it's that magnitude. And the reason it is is that the, the mirror is four meters in aperture, where the biggest thing we've ever built to date is about 1.5 meters to two. So this is huge. This is 16 times the thing. It's going to be on Haleakala 10,000 feet high, um, and it's going to have really advanced instruments in it. Um, uh, 
a big uh, thermal system. <laughs> um, but so, so the telescope is very real. Um, this is this is the M this is the M1 primary being polished. And if if anybody wants to see any of these videos or any of these images, just go to the DKIS website, dkis.nso.edu. So this is this is a little video of the University of Arizona working on the polishing, lapping of the of this off-axis aspheric uh, primary. Yeah, so, so this, this machine is actively putting pressure on the lapping such that we can uh, achieve the prescription that we want over time. Um, so th that's, uh, that mirror sitting in a lab in, in Arizona, the telescope enclosure itself uh, a few months ago was sitting on a concrete pad in Spain and it has recently been packed up and shipped and will be in site this spring. So this is a picture of it in Spain. Here's the, the big telescope mount. So this, these are the nasimuth focus for the tes telescope. The primary is going to sit here, secondary up here. All of these pipes here is that thermal budget, that thermal system that keeps the heat. The energy is dumped um, into a set of AC coolers off into a, a secondary facility. And those coolers melt ice that is made at night on the summit. So they chill, they chill water at night where when energy is less uh, used on the island and it's cheaper. They make ice, they pre-cool, they, 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 they make the ice and then they dump the heat into it. Yep. Uh, it isn't, it's, it's an aluminum. So then it comes to its Gregorian focus. Um, at the Gregorian focus, we field stop it down to, we, we put a field stop at the Gregorian focus, which stops it down to th uh, uh, five arc minutes. So what is that, 20% of the sun? Yeah, so anything that lies outside of that five arc minutes is dumped into a heat dump. Uh, I, I don't know much about that, truthfully, I'll say. It's not a reflective surface. It's <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's a focusing beam, I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're cooling the field stop, so the field stop is a conical piece. And the the stop there, the solar image, that focused image, so I yeah. Got a question? So right. So why don't we use liquid nitrogen or liquid uh, carbon dioxide? Um, it would be nice. There's a lot. There's a lot of thermal energy there, the, um, but water actually, yeah, the specific heat of water is is very high, so it can sop up a lot of heat without being dissipated. So, and it's and it's a lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. Uh, yeah. Let me. Uh, so, a video or two of this thing. This is the telescope mount moving around. So super smooth and quiet. I don't know if you can hear the the motors in the background. <laughs> so this this huge telescope mount assembly is, uh, I think, being disassembled now in a in a factory in Rockford, Illinois. So this is coming for Rockford, Rockford, Illinois. Uh, they're starting to build it right now. And then that Couday lab where they put all the instruments is, is here. This was a movie, but I guess not. So this, um, this platform is the same that's being shown here where all the instruments are. So all of the weight that's on here, and I don't actually know the full budget, sits on a platform that rotates actively throughout the day in order to take the image rotation out of our images. 
Um, and all the electronics ride along with it. So these are huge electronic racks, two, two of which are in the next room. Um, and then these are all of the instruments. So this is, this is 10 feet here in this direction. So you can get some sense of the scale. Um, uh, it's 60, is it 60 feet, I think? Yeah, 60 feet. Yeah, so the, the, the thermal budget is hard. Uh, the, 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 the fundamental limit actually is the heat that we can put on the deformable mirror, which is the adaptive optics uh, correction unit for the telescope. That, that pupil can only take such amount of heat, and that pupil is already big enough, big as it is, it's 10 inches. Uh, so this, this deformable mirror is huge, and it can only take so much heat, and that's what fundamentally limits the, the telescope. Okay. Um, So two, two, were, two slides for my instrument, just to give you an advertisement of what it does. Um, and I can come back and talk about it at a different time if you want. Um, what we're developing in IFA, I, I, at IFA is a very special uh, instrument that looks at infrared spectral lines for magnetism study of sunspots. And what's really special about it is that in years past, we always had to take a very fine piece of the solar um, surface along a slit or something so that you could take that piece of the solar surface, a 1D slice, and then put the spectra in the other dimension. So it's really hard to say if you want to take an image of the sun and also look at, this, at the spectra, spectra at the same time. The things that do that are called image slicers or IFUs, and they're really hard to build, but we're building one. And what it basically is is it's, it's a set, it's an, it's an array that consists of 19,000 fibers. These are little bitty 10 micron wide by 30 micron um, uh, lead alkali glass fibers that are made into ribbons and put together into a really close pack array. So there's, n there's 20,000 of them in this little square packet. And then that, those fibers are then split off and put into those 1D segments. Right? And it is then in this area between the segments where we put the spectra. But this is a very high resolution, very narrow spectral band. So this is a very narrow piece of the spectrum that we're putting in there. And the only way we can do that is, is with very specialized filters um, that the communication industry was building. And what we basically do is we, we take that solar image, we put in the spectrograph, we do polarimetry on it, which splits it up into two beams, and we get an image that looks like this. Um, so this is at 1.6 micron looking at two iron lines that are magnetically sensitive. So, yeah, so this is, um, this is a, a prototype, so it's four slits, not five. So this is one slit, two slit, three slit, four slit, and then these are the orthogonally polarized uh, beams from a Wallaston prism. So they're, yeah, S and P. And for, so the, the little segments here, the dark areas between them, each dark area is, is the size, uh, is the separation between the ribbons that are in this fiber unit. Um, so across this image, every, p every piece of this ribbon is coming from different pieces of the solar surface. So it, it looks very different than a, a normal slit spectrograph where you can right away tell where the sunspot is. But the sunspot in this one is here because you can see this iron line has a, a Zeeman splitting in it here. Um, whereas over here you don't see as much splitting. Um, but, but, the, but the idea of this instrument is that you can take this 20,000 fibers and step it across the solar image very fast. And for every step, you get a couple arc seconds, or in some cases, we can get tens of arc seconds. We get spatial information and spectral information, polarimetry, all at the same time, all at the same time. And that's crucial for measuring the very, very quick dynamics of the solar atmosphere. And it, it's just so fast. I mean, these are observations that we did in. Um, so, uh, right, this this movie is from Sunspot, New Mexico, uh, from a from a telescope um, that were that we had this uh, prototype working, and this is looking at a helium line at, at one micron, ten eight thirty. This is the spectrum here. So this is a silicon line in the photosphere, a, t a terrestrial water line, and this is a hydrogen line. And what we're looking at is this sunspot, and we're looking at dynamic fine structure that are coming out of the sunspot in the helium part of the chromosphere. 
And, but for every single piece of this image, every, every pixel of this image, we have uh, 250,000 resolution spectra. This is only intensity, but we can also do it in polarimetry. But so this thing, this is about 0.3 arc second sampling across this image. And what this took us to do is we take that package and we do a five by five mosaic. So this whole image, this whole data cube of all of the spectra, all of the image and everything is 25 exposures. 20, and we can do it in about 25 seconds. The equivalent spectra, uh, slit spectrograph uh, of old of old being you know, five years ago, it, it would take 300 images to do that same thing. So we're getting an order of magnitude better just by doing this fiber thing. Of course, it's hard. <laughs> anyway, we're very excited about this and I can talk more later, but uh, I think with that, I, I'll, I'll finish it up. It's getting late. Yeah. Okay, again, th thanks for everything. Thanks for everybody coming around, and uh, I'll stick around for a few minutes if anybody wants to talk. But uh, thanks, thanks again.